Brethren, we are so pleased that God has honored us here in this fellowship and the things, the place and the things that he has granted us to use in his service, that we may honor his name and strengthen and equip his people by using them in this way to host you, to see your faces in our place of meeting, and to hear your voices. I want to give a special thanks to our sisters, sisters of this fellowship. Amen. Uh, Amen. Seven or eight of them in particular who have provided the meals. Uh, not every meal, but they've been back there helping, especially my dear sister and wife and sister Jerry Beerbaum, who is a dear friend, has been for years and years, has cared for me. There are others too but I wanted to mention them in particular. The Apostle Paul writes this letter to the believers in Colossae, believers that he has not met. He has never seen their face as a whole. He has met some of them. He writes to them who are being attacked. The simplicity of their devotion and faith in Christ is under attack by messengers of Satan one who wants to deceive them and distract their minds from the simple and plain truth that they have received, the fullness of God that they have received by their faith in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, he does not address this issue as we might, according to human thinking, human reason, or rationality. That's because he's led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives him this truth to reinforce the things he says, the things that they have already heard that have been preached to them, the things that have been stored up for them in heaven. He seeks to establish them firm and unmoved from the hope that's been held out to them in this gospel, this good news that's been sent to them from heaven, from God the Father himself, preaching the gospel the proclamation and declaration of this truth announces God's purpose, his wisdom, and his power in the cross of Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus himself. There were many, we've already been reminded in other messages, there were many who died on crosses in Palestine in that day. None, none died before, then, or since as that one died on that cross on that day. All things pertaining to life and godliness are made known to us through him who became for us, who was made for us by his Father, wisdom from God and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. He took upon himself the body that was prepared for him by the Father, willingly, willingly. He took that body upon himself, made like us in every way, in all points, made like us that he might deliver us from the one who held the power of death over us and kept us in fear, that is, the liar, the accuser, the deceiver, the snake, that old serpent, Satan. In the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers, supplication with loud crying, tears, to the one who was able to save him from death. He was heard Amen. because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him. That's us, the source of eternal salvation. Eternal salvation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Peace is recognized, acknowledged, as one of the highest aspirations of humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most of us that have been here this week have cut ourselves off from the world. We've not been listening to the news. We've not been paying attention to what's been going on out there. It's been wonderful. Amen. Not only because of that, primarily because of what we've shared and spoken and declared to one another, but it's been wonderful to be shut off from those things. We know that many of you who have seen or heard some of the things that are still going on out there, we assume they're still going on out there. We haven't been very concerned about them. Have heard talk about peace. Well, really, I should say the lack of peace, shouldn't I? 
in many places, the lack of peace. Whether it be on the streets of our own country, in the hearts and lives of citizens of this land, or in the mountains of Central Europe, or in Africa, in places in Asia, no peace. No peace. And yet in spite of the offering of peace that men have, in this good news of the gospel that's declared and announced to them, in spite of that, few take seriously the opportunity and the offer that they have of peace from him. They are wrapped up in their sin. Sin is what has caused this lack of peace with God. Now, the results of it are, is a lack of peace everywhere. <laughs> All of the things that we hear talked about on the news every day are the fruit of that disobedience and that violation of him who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And the fact that we have no peace with him as a whole. Humanity has no peace with God. They have violated him. They've turned their back on him. Now, this is not a grave matter in the natural mind, in those who do not believe the gospel and will not obey Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not a matter of any significant importance. Why, they're just going about their natural lives doing their natural things. And sin is natural in that environment, in that case. Nothing unusual, nothing to be too concerned about. Uh, to a degree, of course, they even they recognize. <laughs> even they recognize the problems associated with it. Few, though, give serious thought to God's wrath that has been announced and promised and shown in figures throughout history. This wrath against humanity that has been promised to come in its time on the day of God. Even his covenant people received his wrath. When sin reached the place where there was no more remedy, as the prophet records in 2 Chronicles 36, 16. Those who live that way continue hell-bent on their course where they themselves will receive wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, where he will render to every man according to his deeds. Those who, through, who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation awaits them. That's what is stored up for them. And they add to that store by their viol continued violation, rejection, and disobedience of him. Jesus gave ample testimony. Among other things, he said that he will cast out the worthless slaves into outer darkness. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They will go away into eternal punishment while the righteous go to eternal life. Eternal life is not known in this realm. And peace as it's declared to us clearly in Scripture is foreign and alien to the thinking and the vocabulary of those who live in the realm of disobedience who in their minds are alien to God and show that by their disobedient activities. But by the grace of God, those of us who have set our affection on things that are above because of our transformed lives by our faith in his grace, in his mercy, our citizenship is above. We have been justified by our faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we exalt. We exalt in the hope 
of the glory of God. Amen. Now to speak about these things to the natural man, it's not reasonable. It doesn't make sense. Why are they concerned? Why we have enough to be concerned about here and now? They can't see that. They cannot see that. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Now, they may hear the fact. They may hear the events that happened in that city on that day and the three men who were put to death in the days of Pontius Pilate. But it means nothing. They can make no connection to themselves or to the environment, the reality that appears to them. For well, these are more than facts. They're more than events in history. God has revealed them to those whose hearts are tender toward him, who want to know these things. We hear them in the preaching of the gospel. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. So the preaching of this message is foolishness to those who are perishing. Mm -hmm. Foolishness. But God's grace, his favor that inclines his good, and his benefits to those of us who are the object of his pleasure. It is the power of God to us. It is what transforms us hearing it. It gives us life. It gives us life. And these things, these good things from his hand abound to those of us who live in faith. As far as sin increases, grace increases all the more. There are no answers. There are no answers to this dilemma of sin on this earth. Amen. The answer comes from above. We've spoken about it. So many of you have spoken about it this week. The answer comes from him who loved us, who gave his one and only for us, who demonstrated his love for us. The answer comes from the throne of heaven, the very one who was offended and violated. As sin reigned in death, so grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes here in the first chapter of Colossians in verses 19 and 20. This is our text for this evening, for my part of the evening. The apostle has expressed his confidence and his joy in their progress in faith. And he writes telling them that he prays for them that this would continue for them. And so that it might, he announces these things to them, enlarging and magnifying this clear and simple truth that they have already embraced. I want to begin reading in verse 15. He, this is the focus of the message that they'd already heard, and the apostle announces it again. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Mm -hmm. He's referring them back to what he's just reminded them of, that they've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his God's beloved son. That son is the one who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created. However they're being accosted or attacked, whatever is threatening their faith, however they are, they are reasoning and rationalizing this false teaching, the apostle announces and declares to them, he, in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him. Now that covers a lot of territory. <laughs> wherever these teachers are coming from and wherever they're trying to lead them. The lordship of Jesus Christ, the things that the Father has given his Son, 
because he is pleasing to him in fulfillment of his promise, that covers it all. That covers it all. Amen. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body. I think Paul assumes they know what he means when he says that, uses that terminology of the body there. They know what he means. That's been taught to them. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything, whatever they're teaching you, brethren, he's saying, whatever they're teaching you, wherever they want you to go, whatever they're telling you that you're missing, whatever they're telling you that you misunderstand, Jesus, that bows the knee to him. That bows the knee to him. Amen. And this is why. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. That's large. <laughs> that is large. I, there's nothing. There is nothing that is taught or talked about. Whether we're talking about the religions of the Far East or the Near East or darkest Africa or the southern tip of South America or Alaska, wherever on the face of this earth, whatever form it may take, it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. Whatever's being addressed, however it's being addressed, who He is, what the Father has done in him and worked through him takes care of it, addresses it, covers it, Amen. meets that need for humanity. Amen. There's nothing been left undone. All the fullness dwells in the Son. Amen. Now that's, that's very general. The message that has been announced to them and the message that we have believed is somewhat more specific than that. In, in a way, it's more specific than that. You see, in the preaching of the gospel, the Father makes known to us who we are, along with who he is, where we stand, along with where he is seated, <laughs> above all, his attitude toward us, as well as ours toward him. See, all of that is covered in the preaching of the gospel. He enlightens, coming into the world, he enlightens every man. The Apostle John said. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Scripture speaks of no other man in this way. The Father himself spoke that way, though. We know, don't we? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Father dwelt with him. No one else, no one else knew the Father like the Son. He said that himself. No one knows the Son but the Father. No one had this relationship with the Father. And he sent him here to speak to us, to declare these things of himself, and in doing that also about us, to make known to us his yearning heart that we would not be destroyed, that we would not be swept away in the wrath that was coming. Everything, everything in human history was moving toward Jesus. Every event in Hebrew history, in all of the history, from the first Adam that brought sin and death into this world to the second man, the second man, made in the image of God, born, begotten of God from above, of the Virgin Mary, who walked with the Father, who knew the Father, in whom Satan had no place, no part, Amen. who gave himself to the Father unreservedly, who walked with the Father knowing what the Father was doing, 
knowing where the Father was leading, knowing the Father's words and deeds, all of these things, all of these things, the Father had made known to the Son, and more, more, why he had given all judgment into the hand of the Son, that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He and the Father were one. All the fullness dwell in him. There is no room. There is no room for discussion or argument, human reasoning or rationale about what that exactly means. It is a statement of truth. It's not for us to discuss or even discover. It is for us to accept and believe and receive the power that comes from it that he intends for us to have because all of the Father dwells in him. It's not important for us to be able to explain it. He said it. He taught it. He established it for us to believe it. And because we believe it, we follow the Son. Mm -hmm. We hear his voice. We feed on him. We walk in his light. We join ourselves to him. And by joining ourselves to him, we join ourselves to the Father. The culmination of everything that God was doing was embodied in Jesus. God walking among men in the flesh, full of grace, and truth. No man had seen God at any time, but God, the only Son, I know that's translated many ways, God, the only Son, has made him known. He has made him known. This doesn't come through education. It doesn't come from books. Although we read the scripture that's been recorded for us, this truth about him does not come from ink on paper. The brother the other evening, how many books did he have laying on this table out here? Books about Jesus? <laughs> the people, most of them, I understood from him, most of them who had written those books did not believe what the scripture says about Jesus. Well, see, this information about his identity does not come only from the written scripture. It is made known to us by the Father. No one knows the Son but the Father. Amen. And who he is, what he has done, and what this means for humanity cannot be discovered simply through research and study. If that's the case, then the truth is available to any ungodly person who would use it for their own ends. And they try, don't they? They try. Through Jesus, the whole world potentially is brought into peace with the Father, the one enthroned over the circle of the earth. Now, Scripture records God's view of humanity very clearly. As a friend of mine used to say, it's not a pretty picture. The record from the Old Testament scripture that the Apostle Paul strings together from a number of different sources or places is recorded for us in the third chapter of Romans. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes.
from the throne of heaven. Sin is a sober, serious matter. Amen. It's not lifestyle. It's not choices that humanity makes. Well, here's one over here like that, or there's another one over there. Look at him. And oh, there's another. What? Diversity. Isn't that wonderful? Diversity. See the way that men have rationalized? Sin is a serious matter from the throne of heaven. It violates his nature, forcing him to do what he would not do. To thrust us forever from his presence. He would not do that. He's not made us for that. That is not the purpose or inclination of his heart. He would draw us to himself. He would share himself with us. He would identify with us. He would live with us. He has made us for that purpose. So he says through the prophet, say to them, say to them, Ezekiel, as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die? And he said this to Israel. He said this to his people who were in covenant with him. This is to say nothing of the masses of the remainder of us Gentiles who were living in darkened understanding. The condition was such that no one could be found to stand in the gap. Amen. This gap that had separated God from his creature, the creator from his creature. No one could stand in the gap. Nor could any man be found. No one could be found to plead for the course of humanity. Amen. There were some who had tender hearts. Mm -hmm. There were some who saw mm -hmm. the real condition and circumstances, the reality that was behind the veil, mm -hmm. the appearance and the rationale, or should I say irrationale, of humanity. There were some who had tender hearts, and they pled like this. Although our iniquities testify against us, O oh Lord, act for thy name's sake. Amen. Truly our apostasies have been many. We have sinned against thee. That was Jeremiah. One of the psalmists said, Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of thy name and deliver us, and forgive us our sins for thy name's sake. Now listen, God has an ear toward that kind of request. Amen. When his people call on his name and appeal to his nature, what he is like, for the honor of his name, mm -hmm. before principalities and powers, mm -hmm. God moves. God acts. Amen. Now we know, because we live in a greater light, that these things were all laid out by God before the foundation of the earth. Mm -hmm. That the Father and the Son had planned together to work these things out according to the grand purpose of His will. Mm -hmm. And in humanity, as his eyes searched to and fro throughout the earth, seeking one whose heart was tender, he found them. He found them. There were not many. But the ones whose hearts were tender and were drawn to him, he undergirded it. He strengthened their cause. For their cause was his cause, Amen. the sake of his name. And so he heard them. The Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight. 
that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Now, it's true the prophet makes it appear that this is somewhat of a surprise, unplanned thing. We know because of greater light that it's not. Amen. It's not unplanned. It looked that way to men. But the Father was working out everything according to the purpose of his will. Mm -hmm. Amen. Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. Amen. And he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as with a mantle. Amen. And what were some of the first scriptures that came to the minds of the apostles when they saw Jesus react to the way his father's house was being treated there in John 2? Mm -hmm. Zeal for thy house has consumed me. Yeah, amen. He wrapped himself in zeal. There were many in his ministry who tried to turn him away to different things. This is all Satan working. You know, Satan tried it himself right from the beginning. Turned these rocks into bread. Jump off. He'll give his angels charge concerning thee. All this has been given to me, and I give it to whom I please if you bow down and worship me. Our Lord was ready. He was not deceived. His eyes were clear. Amen. But Satan did not relent or give up after the first encounter or after that encounter. He waited for other opportune times. There were others who came some wanting him to do apparently small things. Lord, my brother will not share the inheritance with me. Oh, Lord, Lord, uh, your, your mother and your brothers are outside wanting you. Come, let's make him king. Look what he's done this day. Let's make him king. He would not be dissuaded from the task the Father had committed to him. Amen. Zeal. Zeal was his mantle for the will of his Father. And we know that through him the Lord has dealt with us according to his name not according to our evil ways or our corrupt deeds. He is the precious one, the one and only sent from the Father, the one and only who had seen his glory, who was loved by the Father before the world began, who disrobed himself and took up the body that was prepared for him, entrusting himself into the Father's will in the domain of the liar and deceiver. He loved righteousness, and he showed it as he walked among men. He loved the righteousness and hated lawlessness. And therefore, the Father anointed him with the oil of gladness above every other. And we, his brethren, we benefit. We share in the abundance of life that he came to bring us. We have been entrusted to him by the Father, mm -hmm. and he has delivered us back to the Father. Amen. All of this 
all of this done by the one who embodied the fullness of God mm -hmm. and yet shared in our humanity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. shared in our yeah. flesh and blood that he might give help to us that he might be tender toward us that he might show us mercy while at once being faithful to the Father, a merciful and faithful high priest giving help to his brethren. Amen. This is what he is for us. We taste the riches of his grace made known to us in Christ Jesus. And there's more. The apostle goes on in verse 20, Colossians 1. Through him, to reconcile all things to himself. And then he has kind of a parenthesis in there. He goes to the end of the sentence, referring back to the all things. I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. All things. The Father and the Son enacted this exchange. It was between them. We stood by and could say nor do not. Well, we could say some things. For instance, we could say, Woe is me, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, living in the midst of a people of unclean lips. We could say things like that. A little good it would do to accomplish or obtain or achieve anything for ourselves. And yet, God hears statements like that, an acknowledgement of ourselves. He hears that, and that day, he cleansed the lips of that man and transformed him, mm -hmm. transformed him. Mm -hmm. Jesus saw the joy set before him. He did not regard equality as something to be hung on to or grasped. He took the form of a servant, a bond servant. He despised the shame that came along with it. That was nothing. That was nothing compared to what the Father had promised and the Father intended and proposed in him. Nothing. And so he endured the cross. And now he is seated having finished that work. Mm -hmm. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And when he came, when he first walked this earth, the whole world lay in the power of the evil one. Deceived. We were by nature children of wrath. Deceived by the liar. The whole world following after him gathering together, doing war against God and his name and everything that the Father stood for. But the day belongs to God. Amen. The day belongs to him and he has turned it. He has turned it and made it a day of salvation, the one of his favor. Amen. Where his glory and his name is announced and proclaimed. And then the day will come when his son will again be revealed on the clouds with his holy angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution upon those who know not God and do not obey the gospel, the blessed and eternal gospel of Jesus Christ, that God himself was in the son, reconciling the world to himself, bringing the world back, opening the way providing Amen. providing for the honor of his name and for the blessed benefit of his people, those whose ears were attentive, those who were blind and would confess it, those who could not walk but longed to, Amen. those who were dead. But when they heard the voice of the Son of God, they came alive. Amen. The blessed gospel 
God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. Several of the brethren have already noted eloquent terms that the not counting was because of the cross, because everything was looking to the cross. Everything before, everything since focused on the cross and what took place that day in the sun. Sin is accounted for. The Father is proved true and right, righteous in all that he has done. Amen. And yet he is merciful. He is merciful. Brother, this afternoon already mentioned that passage from Psalm 85, verses 8 through 10. I would read it again. It is precious. Amen. In it, the Father announces what he is doing. And the psalmist tells us what he hears. I will hear what God the Lord will say. See, in the declaration and proclamation of his truth and his bared right arm, I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. See, this message is not for everyone. It is offered to everyone. It only benefits those who enter it, those who want it, Amen. those whose hearts long for it. Give themselves to it. He will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. We've had a taste of that the last two or three days, haven't we? Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other Amen. in the sun. Who in flesh the fullness of God on earth. The son himself alone brought these things together when he offered himself as a sacrifice, a guilt offering. To his father. This message is larger than when it's first perceived. This is what the apostles revealing to these brethren here in Colossae. He says, don't be deceived, brethren. There's more here than what may appear. And he begins to open it up and enlarge it for them that they may see. That they may see how large a place God has set their feet on. How solid and firm and secure is their life in the sun. And these things are practical. They fit us. And you see, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Now, even those who don't believe will, will acknowledge that Jesus is one of the finest men who ever lived. The things that he taught, the things that he said, why, they were wonderful things. You hear unbelievers cite some of those things and say, well, if we could just be like that. Well, the things that he said and did, see, living in the light, close to the Father, is practical. It works. It works even here. And that's not the primary place. That's not the primary place. The real place is in the Father's presence the lasting place, the place where all the good things are, Amen. the place where all the real things are that will not pass away and are not defiled, are kept in heaven for us, and no one can take. No one can take. He predestined us to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The Father intended to enlarge this new race that were born not of the will of men, the will of a father, nor of the blood of humanity, but are born of God, a new race, of whom his son is the firstborn. And he, he himself, is bringing many, many others to his father's glory. This is the father's will 
God the Father, maker and sustainer of all things. Jesus, the one through whom all things came into being and has its being. In fact, all of creation is affected by these things. Things in heaven and on earth. All of creation. Even the cursed order is affected. It is waiting. The apostle says, it is waiting and longing anxiously, waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. All things in heaven and on earth are reconciled, brought together, and restored. This is done with a view to an administration suitable for the time, the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. We miss nothing. We miss nothing in walking in the light. The world will try to tell us that, you young people, you young ones. The world will tell you that you'll miss this or that or the other. Oh, you're going to be cut off. Oh, life will pass you by. That's true. Life here will pass you by and go right into the grave. And you will look for the wicked, but you'll not find them. They'll be gone. They'll be gone. And you will stand in the evil day. You will stand. All things excludes only that which is alien to the Father. Only that which does not fit. All of creation has been permeated by some aspect of the Father's nature, what he is like. That's why the Apostle could say there in Romans 1 that his invisible nature, invisible things of him, his divine nature's evidence somewhat in things that are made. Since all of this fits together, it has all been affected by the pinnacle of his creation, humanity, when they rejected him. And in the Son, in whom dwells all the fullness of God, he's bringing it all back together. And we are part of it. We are part of it. In fact, we are the focus of it. We and all the other brothers who are made just. By the Son. He's made peace through the blood of its cross. The Father has done this. The Father has done this. And this is more than Adam and Eve had in the garden. Much more. This has been mentioned already, but I must say it again. For years and years I did not see this. That we have more than they. They had innocence. But it was an innocence of not knowing. We have seen and know now, and we have rejected because what we've seen is better. We have rejected the things that are here. We have rejected the liar. We have exposed him for what he is by our faith. Amen. The Father has done it in us for his name's sake. And we continue to benefit. We continue to benefit. Jesus came announcing these things to men, to those who would listen. He said to them, one place in John, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you shall die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word that I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me commandment what to say, what to speak. And I know that his commandment leads to eternal life. Therefore, the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. That last day there in Jerusalem, his last public sermon, he spoke to the Father in the presence of the people. And the Father answered him, Father, glorify thy name. And the Father said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. 
Father and the Son, worked these things as man sat along the side. Lost, helpless, unable to act for themselves. And so the Father, in his wisdom, was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Now you can see in this the things that occurred between the Father and the Son. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. As he will bear their iniquity. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong. Amen. That's us, brother. That's us. Because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. The Lamb of God. Worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. The Father provided the way for us to be restored and not banished. And that way was in his son. Amen. His life poured out before the Lord as a guilt offering. The merit of his very being securing what none else could secure for us before the Father. Amen. The son of righteousness has risen with healing in its wings and we are cleansed, we are clean and we stand before the Father and we gladly say, I volunteer in the day of your power. Father, Give me something to do. Send me. What can I do? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. His blood and his blood alone speaks truth and wisdom, justice and righteousness, redemption, sanctification, cleansing, regeneration. No other blood speaks this way. Amen. And it continues to speak, for he ever lives and intercedes for us in the Father's presence. The one whom we need, just what we need, high, holy, and lifted up. Amen. He entered the most holy place once at the end of the ages, having obtained eternal redemption by his blood of the eternal covenant offered through the eternal spirit. These things that the Father and the Son have accomplished for us and poured out upon us in the preaching of his gospel in the, in the great benefit of his abiding presence in his people by his spirit. Worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, John heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 